In this video, I'm going to work through some practice problems using linear independence. So for the first several problems, we're going to have sets of vectors, and we're going to try to figure out whether or not those sets are linearly independent without actually setting up an augmented matrix and solving a vector equation, because we've learned some theorems about shortcuts and ways that we can avoid doing that full process. So for the first one, we have a set of a single vector, and that vector is the vector 0, 0, 0, and we want to know if that set is linearly independent. So one of the things we talked about when we talked about a set of a single vector is that the, is that, that set is linearly independent exactly when that vector is not the zero vector. So the set with the vector A is linearly dependent since A is the zero vector. Another way to do this would just be to realize that if I multiply that vector A by any non-zero scalar, I'll just pick the number five randomly. So five times A, that's five times zero, zero, zero. That's zero, zero, zero. And so five A equaling zero is a dependence relation because there's only one vector, so there's only one scalar, and this scalar is not zero. So there's a couple different ways to do this one. Next up, here we have a set of two vectors, and we want to know whether this set is linearly independent. We talked about that case as well, and what we said was that that set, a set of two vectors, is linearly independent exactly when neither vector is a scalar multiple of the other. So what we can do is we can investigate that. We can say, well, is m a scalar multiple of the vector n? So we could imagine that maybe that scalar is called k, and so we try to set up a vector equation that look like, looks like m equals k times n. So m is the vector negative 1, 3. I've got k times negative 3, negative 9. And that would give me negative 1, 3 is equal to negative 3k, negative 9k. And the question is, can this happen? Is this possible for some value of k? Well, that would mean that in my first entry, negative 1 would have to equal negative 3k which would say k would have to be one third. But in my second entry, three would have to equal negative nine k, which means k would have to equal negative one third. Well, k can't be both. It can't be one third and negative one third. So there's no such value of k. So we would say that this set m n is linearly independent since neither of the vectors, neither vector, is a scalar multiple of the other. That's the test that we have when we have two vectors in a set, is we look to see if either of the vectors is a scalar multiple of the other. That didn't happen in this case, so our set is linearly independent. Now we've got more than two vectors, so here's where things might get more complicated, but in this case we have another shortcut because what we have here is a set of four vectors, all of which are in R3. So we have four vectors, each with three entries. And we had another theorem that talked about more vectors than entries. So you might remember that from our lecture, more vectors than entries. And that tells us that this set is linearly dependent. Whenever you have a set of vectors that has more vectors than those vectors have entries, the set must be linearly independent. I'm oh, sorry, it must be linearly dependent. I misspoke there. All right, last one of these. So again, we're back to the case where we have two vectors. And again, we have, uh, we're wondering whether or not one vector is a scalar multiple of the other, either just by looking at it. Sometimes we can just look at these and see it, or by doing the same trick with the Ks that we did back in part B, we can see that in fact, U here, is exactly uh, two thirds, negative two thirds times v. Just to show you that, negative two thirds times v is negative two thirds times negative three, six, negative 12. Multiply that out, I get positive two, negative four, and eight. So since u is a scalar multiple of v, the set containing u and v is linearly dependent.
And again, that goes back to our test for a set of two vectors. Okay, a couple more problems here. Again, we're sort of playing around with these definitions, thinking about making sure we understand what it really means for a set to be linearly independent, linearly dependent. So in this case, we've got a vector with this unknown quantity h, and what we're wondering is for which values of h is this set linearly independent? Well, in general, if we want to know whether a set of vectors is linearly independent, what we need to do is we need to solve the vector equation x1, v1, plus x2, v2, plus x3, v3, equals 0. Now, in general, this is a technique, this is a sort of thought process that we could have gone through for the previous problems, except that I said I wanted you to think about it without actually solving a vector equation. I wanted you to think about those shortcuts. But here, if we're not sure what to do because of that weird h, we can just go ahead and solve that vector equation. So the augmented matrix for this vector equation is going to have columns v1, v2, which is negative 2, negative 9, 6, v3, 3h, negative 9, and then our augmented column is going to be all zeros. And then we start row reducing. I'm just going to do this one by hand because it's only going to take a couple of steps. I'm going to leave row 1 alone since I've got a pivot that's a 1 in my first row, first column. I'm going to replace row 2 by negative 5 times row 1 plus row 2. That's going to give me a 0 here. That's going to give me a 1 here. Negative 2 times negative 5 is positive 10. And then negative 2 times 3 is going to be negative 6 plus that h, and then I'm still going to get a 0 there. And then at the same time, I'm going to multiply, or I'm going to replace row 3 by 3 times row 1 plus row 3. That gives me a 0 here. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, gives me a 0 here. 3 times 3 is 9, gives me a 0, and gives me a 0. And after just those two steps, my matrix isn't in reduced echelon form, but it is in echelon form. And remember, if I'm just trying to figure out if my set of vectors is linearly dependent or linearly independent, I can base that conclusion simply on the locations of the pivots. And what I'm seeing here is that I've got a pivot here, I've got a pivot here, and I definitely do not have a pivot in this third column. No matter what the value of h is, it doesn't matter what the value of h is, I'm never going to have a pivot in that third column. So what does that mean? So in general, when we have an augmented matrix, because we don't have a pivot in the fourth column, in the augmented column, our vector equation is consistent. But of course, every homogeneous vector equation is consistent because it always has an augmented column that's all zeros. So this is no surprise that we have no pivot in the fourth column, but it's worth noting. And then we have no pivot in the third column. That means that we have a free variable, that x3 in my original equation is a free variable. So that means my homogeneous equation the vector equation that I started with has infinitely many solutions. And that means that my set of vectors is linearly dependent, and that's true no matter what h is, because again, the non-existence of a pivot in column 3 didn't depend on that value of h. So the set of vectors v1, v2, and v3 is linearly dependent no matter what h is. So one thing that I want to emphasize here is both the setup before I row reduced the matrix and the conclusion after I row reduced the matrix. Don't just take the vectors, slap them in a matrix and row reduce and then try to figure out what's going on. You want to understand why are you setting up that matrix in the first place. In this case, we set up that matrix because we needed to solve this vector equation. That's why we set up the matrix. And then once we row reduced the matrix, we knew why we were doing it, and so we were looking for whether or not there were any non-trivial solutions. Because we found that there were infinitely many solutions because of that free variable, that gave us our conclusion. So you really want to set the stage for what you're doing and why you're doing it before you just launch into row reduction. All right, one last question. So this time we've got just some abstract vectors. We don't have any idea what the numbers in these vectors are. We've got four vectors in R5, and we're given this fact. We're told that u3 is equal to 2u1 plus u2. And we want to explain why, given that information, this set of four vectors is linearly dependent. And, and the way we're going to do it is by finding a dependence relation for this set. So here what we have is this equation, u3 
equals 2u1 plus u2. And so what I'm going to do, remember a dependence relation is a linear combination of these vectors that equals 0, but where some of the scalars are not 0. Or in other words, not all of the scalars, not all of the weights in my linear combination are 0. So if I subtract u3 from both sides, I get pretty close to what I want. I've got 1 times u2 here, and I've got negative 1 times u3, because I subtracted u3 from both sides. So this is almost a dependence relation, but it's missing u4. Remember, to be a dependence relation, it has to be a linear combination of all of the vectors in my set. So what I need is some scalar multiplied by u4. And we need to think about what we need to put there. Well, we don't know a darn thing about the vector u4. We, don't, we have no idea what it is. So what is a number that we could put there that would not change the fact that our left-hand side of our equation here is the zero vector? We don't want to mess with that. So if I put, you know, again, I'm just going to make up a number. If I put the number 5 here, well, now I no longer know that this equation adds up to the zero vector because I don't know what u4 is, and so I've just changed what the left-hand side is going to be because I've changed the right-hand side. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put zero in that blank because regardless of what u4 is, if I multiply u4 by zero, I'm going to get the zero vector, which means I still get the zero vector on the left-hand side because all of this equals the zero vector, and this equals the zero vector, the zero vector plus the zero vector really does equal the zero vector. And this is a dependence relation. Why? Since not all of the scalars are zero. All right, so I hope this helped, again, this class has a lot of terminology, a lot of vocabulary words. Linear dependence is something that's going to come up a lot over the next several lectures. So review these problems, review the lectures talking about these concepts, and keep working on it.